Hi everyone, Nemo here. Welcome to my wrap up of 2023 in Mormonism. I'm going to lay out all the major stories and remind you of the absolute whirlwind of a year the church has had. It started in January, as years tend to, with Russell M. Nelson celebrating five years on the throne. If we zoom into his announcement on Instagram, we see he has a card celebrating five years of inspired leadership. Those five years brought us his attack on the nickname Mormon. To remove the Lord's name from the Lord's church is a major victory for Satan. I still find it strange he can say that with a straight face, given the millions of dollars his predecessors poured into the I'm a Mormon campaign. Anyone travelling around London this April will not be able to miss the hundreds of eye-catching, vibrant I'm a Mormon campaign posters. Those five years also brought us an unprecedented, and some may argue unwarranted, temple building spree. This included a third temple in England, and still no temple in Scotland. Birmingham, the United Kingdom. The site for that temple has been announced, and I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on the progress of that temple and keeping you all up to date with it. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. And going back to names, Kevin S. Hamilton told us in January, Could I suggest an alternative approach? Substitute the word Savior or Lord or Jesus Christ in place of the church. As in, I don't support the Savior's policy on you fill in the blank. Or I don't agree with the way Jesus Christ does this or that. For me, personally, that seems to put a very different perspective on things. So here's some newspaper headlines taking him up on that challenge. February saw the temple endowment ceremony change, not just in its presentation, but in its doctrinal content. This is strange, given that Joseph Smith taught, ordinances instituted in the heavens before the foundation of the world, in the priesthood, for the salvation of men, are not to be altered or changed. All must be saved on the same principles. Dallin H. Oaks also taught, The gospel of Jesus Christ does not change. Gospel doctrine does not change. Our personal covenants do not change. Notable amongst the changes particularly was the removal of the charge to avoid loud laughter as part of the law of the gospel, as well as the removal of the charge to sacrifice all that we possess, even our own lives if necessary, in sustaining and defending the kingdom of God. Perhaps the removal of a covenant to sacrifice your life for the church is what won Russell M. Nelson the inaugural Gandhi King Mandela Peace Prize from Morehouse College in March. Failing that, I'm unsure what President Nelson has done to deserve such a prize, but there we are. April was, of course, General Conference, which saw many of us thinking that Brad Wilcox was finally going to face some consequences for his 2022 remarks that sparked controversy. Maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe instead of saying, why did the blacks have to wait until 1978? Maybe what we should be asking is, why did the whites and other races have to wait until 1829? After all, he was released. Effective immediately, we hereby release brothers Ahmed S. Corbett and Bradley Ray Wilcox from serving as first and second counselors in the young men general presidency. But alas, Brad Wilcox merely failed upwards. A few moments later. It is proposed that we sustain the following as counselors in the young men general presidency, effective immediately. Bradley Ray Wilcox as first counselor and Michael T. Nelson as second counselor. He filled the position left by Ahmed Corbett, who became the second ever African American General Authority 70. How did Ahmed Corbett celebrate this rare and unique opportunity for a black man such as himself? He denigrated activism, the very activism that allows him to hold the priesthood at all. Parents, if your child struggles with a gospel principle or prophetic teaching, please resist any type of evil speaking or activism toward the church or its leaders. These lesser secular approaches are beneath you. In May, Laurie Vallow was convicted of the murder of her two youngest children and of conspiracy to murder Chad Daybell's former wife, Tammy. 
She was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without parole. Her husband, Chad Daybell, will be put on trial in April 2024 for the murder of the same children and his former wife, Tammy. In lighter news... What about, you know, the idea that secrecy builds mistrust? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't feel it's being secret. We feel it's being confidential. What's the difference? The difference is, um, I guess it's a point of view. It's confidential in order to maintain the focus on what our purpose is and what the mission of the church is, rather than the church has X amount of money. But don't you agree this would be a non-issue if there was more transparency? No, because then everyone would be telling us what they wanted us to do with the money. This is Christopher Waddell desperately trying to justify the church's attempts to hide the size and nature of its assets from the public, from the government, and from their own members. The church settled with the SEC in February of this year to the tune of $5 million. Check out the videos above me for more information on that story. Now, in spite of Ahmed Corbett's denigration of activism, a monumental victory was won by activists, including myself, who had been putting pressure on the church in the UK to improve its safeguarding standards and implement background checks. In June, a letter was sent out informing members that background checks were to become mandatory for those working with children and youth in the UK church. This happened purely on the back of activism. The church was not legally compelled to do this. In fact, the church confirmed there was no legal pressure to implement background checks because in February they sent out a letter stating as much in response to the letter that 21st Century Saints and I sent to every bishop in the UK talking about their legal responsibilities towards safeguarding. On to July, the month that saw the church use its wealth and legal might in an attempt to overcome the objections of the citizens of Cody, Wyoming, who did not want the proposed Cody, Wyoming temple to have a spire as large or a location as prominent. But the church doesn't win every legal battle, it would seem. As in August, James Huntsman's lawsuit gained new life. In a majority opinion, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals found that a reasonable juror could conclude that the church misrepresented how tithing was being used with regard to City Creek. This means we may still see a successful recovering of tithing by James Huntsman. Now, the first half of the year has already been pretty full on for the church. So would you believe me when I say that September is the month that things really seem to kick off? As Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt were arrested and charged with the abuse of Ruby's children. And speaking of abused children, the church seemingly out of nowhere disavowed the self-proclaimed rescuer of traffic children, Tim Ballard, in a statement given to Vice News in September. Almost exactly one month later, in October, people began to step forward and accuse Tim Ballard of sexual assault. Not only that, but his relationship with senior apostle M. Russell Ballard, to whom he's not related, was also brought into question. Accusations were made that M. Russell Ballard had given Tim Ballard information relating to high net worth tithe paying individuals to allow Tim to acquire wealthy donors for his work. Before anyone had the chance to get a clearer picture of the situation, M. Russell Ballard passed away in November at the age of 95. Jeffrey R. Holland became the new acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and we all assumed that we'd have to wait until April. April Conference 2024 to learn the new apostle's name. But ever keen to surprise us, the church announced Patrick Kieran as the newest apostle in December. This is the first announcement of a new apostle outside of conference since Geoffrey R. Holland in June 1994. Maybe Patrick Kieran was in a hurry to get into his new position as apostle. Just like maybe he was in a hurry to get somewhere when he was fined £540 for speeding in 1998. Patrick Kieran's speeding fine pales into insignificance when compared to the four counts of aggravated child abuse that Ruby Frankie pleaded guilty to in December, and her sentencing is expected in February 2024. The church has certainly had a busy year, and in covering all this news, frankly, so have I. This year saw me quit my job and dive into the world of full-time content creation on YouTube. It's been a full-on year, and I've loved having the time and freedom to cover all this. I couldn't do it without you, the people that actually watch these videos, and I'm determined to make 2024 even better. If you haven't already, and you feel like you could support my work financially, 10 or $15 a month will allow me to bring to life some of the ideas I've been working on in the background. If you want to see what those ideas are, then hit the subscribe button so you don't miss them. I'm going to take a short break now, and so I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a bright and happy start to what I'm sure will be a memorable 2024. Bye now.